with five seconds. He's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown, Carolina. Back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And it's Carter <laughs> with yes, a sir. 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it! Here's Kupak. Gives off to Amos. He's Amos. good! He's, He's good! good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's Unbelievable! Unreal! Jordan back to kick. It's blocked again! Picked up! It'll be a touchdown, Carolina, for Bracey Walker! He blocks his second punt! Bernard fields it at the 26, heading to the far side, Gio at the 35, Gio, he's at the 50, no he's not, yes he is, Gio, he's gonna take it for a touchdown, are you kidding me? This is the Heel Tough Blog Podcast on Spreaker.com. Hey guys, and welcome to this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. Anthony Pagnotta here with you. As always, Josh Marlowe sitting alongside of me tonight. We got him actually here in person, so no uh, over-the-phone connection this evening. Instead, we will get the take right from the man himself on the Duke game as we are recapping this actually here on a Saturday. Um, Hopefully, uh, hoping I'll be able to get this up uh, pretty soon afterwards. I I don't think I'm going to wait as long. As I have been, um, I think what we'll do is if we do get any other interviews, we can always go back and add them later on uh, to the podcast uh, site, and you guys can listen to it there. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just uh, we'll, we'll jump into the Duke recap real quick, and then we'll uh, circle back a couple other topics that we'll talk about before previewing the Western Carolina game. But we got to start with the Duke recap from today. Pretty much what we, I guess, all expected. Another close game with them. That's kind of how it's been throughout the last few years, mainly under Larry Fedora. And once again today, an opportunity to win a close game. But unfortunately, the Tar Heels just unable to pull it out um, due to a lack of execution and a lack of play calling. Whichever way you want to lean you know, more, that's, that's kind of up to you. We have our opinions and we'll get into them here in just a second, but I want your initial reactions here as as we sit now currently at one and eight on the season. Yeah, another tough loss. Um, like you said, I think it was the game we kind of all expected tight. The only thing I think I was wrong about, I didn't see this game being the shootout that it was, especially in the first half. Um, but it was just another game where Carolina had a chance to win another game on the road in the ACC and couldn't get it done for whatever reason. Um, it's been the same story, I guess, over the last month and a half. They've put themselves in a position to win games and just simply haven't done it. Um, I thought the ground game was the best it's been all year, and the defense was probably the worst it's been all year. So it was just one of those days for Carolina football. I guess focus on the defense here because the last two weeks, that's kind of been the area that has been in question the most. You know, they came into the game against Georgia Tech allowing less than 400 yards of total offense to opponents. And, you know, you you can say whether or not that's good enough for you, but in today's college football, that's a pretty solid number. That's kind of middle of the pack. Um, That number has drastically changed over the last two weeks, allowed 565 yards of total offense last week to Georgia Tech. And then uh, this week, um, I'm not sure how many we allowed total. It was over 600, I know. Um, didn't, don't have that statistic in front of me at the moment, but allowed Daniel Jones 700 or seven, 500, it felt like 700, 547 yards of total offense just by himself. Is it, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people have to realize right now with this defense is they are very banged up, especially on that defensive line and in that secondary. But at the same time, is, is it bad to expect that? this defense should be a lot better than what we've seen these last couple of weeks? No, I think we all expected more from them, especially the way they started at California. They kind of looked, they improved, okay, they can play. Um, Virginia Tech, they played very well up until the final drive. 
for the most part at Syracuse, they've been they were good. Just like I think you and I talked about before the last two weeks, the story of this defense wasn't all around bad. It was just they had bad moments. Whereas the last two weeks, they kind of looked bad for four quarters. Um, so the, I think that's the more troubling thing. They got turnovers last week, uh, today. I only got to see the first quarter and a half or so, so I don't know if they forced a turnover or not. But there's just been the inconsistency at all levels of the defense, and, and that's the more frustrating part. The, the defensive line's been banged up. It's supposed to be the strength of this team. No pass rush today. The linebacking core had, was, was – hasn't been great, and the secondary had their worst game, I think, all year today. Yeah, they did force two turnovers, so that's one of the encouraging things because we've said this for the last few years now. If you're not going to stop somebody, you got to turn the ball over. And so, you know, the last – in 2016, they didn't do that at all. They literally Mm. had one interception the whole year. Right. And then last year, they still had some struggles doing that. I feel like this year – They've done a better job of turning opponents over. The other problem has been, you know, they still have a minus eight turnover differential because they haven't had the ability to keep the ball in their own possession. They've had fumble issues. Really, Nathan Elliott has had two games where he's turned the football over, but when you throw seven combined interceptions in those two games, that's going to hurt that turnover differential a little bit. But yeah, um, they... Really, today, I mean, you look, 536 offensive yards, but when you allow 629, that's really not going to set you up to win games. You did mention, though, the run game. That was one thing that I thought was a positive. In the second half, I felt like it wasn't quite as present as a lot of people wanted it to be, especially in that third quarter. I think one of the things is is that a lot of people were frustrated with the fact that you know they were passing the ball still even as much as they did. In that third quarter, they ran the ball six times. They passed the ball eight times. There's not a a huge differential. But at the same time, I think the question is, if you're having so much success on the ground, run it until they stop you. And, you know, again, Michael Carter in the first half was dominant. 11 touches in the first half. He has just eight in the second half. One of them was a reception. But I think the thing was, it wasn't even the amount of touches that frustrated people. It was how he was getting the football. A lot of handoffs inside where he wasn't having his success in the first half. He was having his success on the edge. And then a couple of, there there was one play in particular that stuck out to me. And it was a second down and eight play where they decided that instead of running the football to get the ball in Michael Carter's hands, they were going to do the swing pass, which they love to do and has not been effective all year. They end up losing five yards on the play, and it puts them in a third down and 13 situation. Instead of running the football, even if you only get a yard or two, you're still in third and six, third and seven instead of third and 13. So, you know, there's a difference even in, you know, third and long and third and a mile. So they, I, I still don't think this coaching staff feels, um, it, it doesn't feel like they know that. I mean, maybe that's just me, but we, we sit here today and it's just some of these decisions, especially the second half play calling where you're like, I, I don't get it. I mean, the one that everybody I think is still frustrated over, it's third down and uh, six, third and six, because they did give him a yard on the play, even though I didn't think he got anything. Third and six, they come in to the original set with two uh, running backs in the backfield. I don't know if it was a running back that was to the left of Elliott. Not sure whether or not that was a tight end or what it was. They end up motioning that guy out and then running to the left side, but they run it straight up the middle. If they would have kept the guy in the backfield, there would have been an extra blocker to take away what was a crashing safety that eventually made the tackle for a one-yard gain. And then on fourth and five, you need five yards. Instead, you throw a deep bomb to the end zone to try to go for a touchdown, and ultimately, he overthrows his wide receiver. So... I, you know, it just seems like this keeps happening. The play calling just continues to be awful in the second half primarily. Duke made the adjustments plain and simple, and this offense didn't. You scored 28 points in the first half. You scored seven in the second half, and the only reason that you scored late in the game was because 
Duke went into a little bit of that prote protective defense with a 14-point lead late in the game. So, you know, right now, if you're North Carolina in, in general, if you're the athletic department, you've got to be thinking, look, you know, we have a guy that right now as coach is not making adjustments at halftime. Isn't that part of being a head coach? Yeah, I mean, that's. I think it's been the knock on Larry since he got to Carolina was the lack of adjustments. Um, I've made this reference many a times. You know, fans will look at Roy Williams not wanting to change what he does during basketball season, but he's won three national titles in all these games. He has, He's earned the right to be stubborn and not change what, what's happening. Larry Fedora doesn't have that hasn't had that kind of success. So and when it's blatant that other teams are adjusting and you're not and it's still not working, there's no excuse. So when you go to the post game, we're gonna look at the film and try to get better. Well, we've won three games in the last two years, so obviously the film work isn't isn't doing the job. Um so it's it's very disturbing and I'd imagine Bubba Cunningham having a close eye on this because I'm sure there are boosters letting him know, hey, we're done we're done giving money to this this program as long as he's uh, the head man. Yeah, no, I I think that's really the mindset around most of the boosters, at least from what I've seen, is that this is a big th this is a big showing point for Bubba Cunningham. He's got to make the right decision here because if he doesn't, I feel like a lot of people are going to say, well, maybe we should have moved on even from Bubba, and and that's. Some of the mindset of the fan base already is that, hey, we've got to move on from Bubba right now. I don't necessarily think it's at that point. I think that right now there there's still should be some confidence in what he's done there because at the least, at least he's at, put some focus on the football program. You know, he's got the new facility, and you can tell that right now there there is some – what am I? There, there's an attitude about this team that hey, we do want to win. It's just about getting the right person in here that can help us win, and that's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of people. I know, you know, we both heard it. There's a lot of people that are telling us, you know, you need to trust this coaching staff at this point. Uh, again, I, I don't really know what there is to trust about this coaching staff here the last two years. Right. And my thing is, is that when you look at it, you know, you need to do things late in games that put you in a position to win games. They're not doing the little things right now when they're in position to win games. We saw it against Virginia Tech. We saw it against Syracuse. We saw it last week against Georgia Tech. And we saw it again today against Duke where we had opportunities. And most of the time, the thing that you're known best for, your offense, right. comes up short in these crucial moments. So, yeah, I, I think at this point, it, it's getting a little bit stale. The argument from a lot of people that still want to keep Larry around is that, well, it hasn't gotten that bad yet. My thing is, why let it get to that point? If you can stop something from happening, that's like saying, well, you know, you can prevent a car crash from happening, but no one's injured yet, so let the car crash happen. Why not stop it before it gets that bad? That's all I'm saying. Don't let this get to a point where you're not able to recover. You're not able to get back to the point of being a program that a lot of people thought might be that team in the Coastal that could one day make the championship every other year. Or, you know, a, a few years in a row. So, you know, I don't know. We sit here and have this same conversation every week. I, I feel like it's getting it, it's getting a little old. Yeah, I mean, for the people that want Bubba Cunningham fired, I think that's a little overreaction. Look at the athletic department as a whole and the success it's had field hockey, men's soccer, women's soccer, baseball, basketball. A bunch of sports under his watch are doing fantastic. He just oversaw projects to upgrade a lot of the facilities on campus, mm -hmm. including the football, getting the practice facility and the uh, the new seats in Keenan. So I, I think it's crazy to want to move on from him. I think he's done a lot of good for the university, helped his kids through the NCAA stuff. Um, so I'm not on that point. But, yeah, you're right. The whole thing with Larry, and it's worth to talk about. 
But it, it, it's starting to get old because we don't know what's going to happen yet because there hasn't been a mandate from Bubba that, okay, he's got to win this game or he's fired. There's been no report out of Chapel Hill that his job's on the line, whereas other places you kind of know going into games like LSU with Les Miles. Right. You know, and some other places. You don't win, well, you're done after tonight. We don't have that yet from Bubba. Um, I think, and I've, I've reiterated, I could be okay with keeping Larry Fedora if he brought in a new staff and tried some new things. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're trying to keep the same guys and it hasn't worked the past two years, especially the defensive coordinator and that staff, then I'm not going to have any respect for what Larry's doing in Chapel Hill. I mean, I still think there are guys on the staff that you look at and say – it, it will be hard to move on from them. Um, most Mostly the guys that he brought in this past year. Like, I don't think Robert Gillespie can go anywhere because the backfield has performed well and he's a good recruiter. Tommy Thigpen in the secondary, mostly uh, handling the safeties. Henry Baker is the guy that focuses on the corners. I feel like the safeties have played pretty well. And again, he's one of your primary recruiters. Right now, he recruits the Charlotte area. So that's one of the big guys, I think. And that's one of the guys you really went out of your way to try to bring here over the offseason. So I don't feel like that's a guy that you can just tell, hey, you know, we're going to move on. And then... I don't know. Luke Paschal, I feel like you still got to keep. I, it, he's, it's his first year. I don't think the receiving core has been great, but at the same time, I don't really think they've been that bad. Same thing with special teams. I don't think they've been as effective as they were last year, but that unit was handled by Coach Fedora. So if unless Coach Fedora you know, doesn't have confidence in him, I think he'll handle that you know, fine going forward. Coach Fedora can, of course – always go back to being the special teams coach if he wants to. Um, but other than that, I think you're right. A lot of these guys, I think, have run their course. You know, one of the guys, of course, that you still would wonder about would be Heckendorf because he does have guys like Bren Renner, Marquise Williams, and Mitch Trubisky under his belt to kind of lean on and say, hey, look, you know, I've made these guys what they are. And I still feel like at the end of the day, this quarterback, there are quarterbacks that show promise on this team. And, and going forward, I feel like Cade Fortin or Jace Reuter next year will be the guy. Now, I could be wrong on that. If Larry's still the coach, probably not. We know what's going to happen. They're going to go in and camp with about seven or eight guys in the quarterback race. Um, there will be uh, just some random walk on. Pretty sure the water boy might even be in the race at the start of the season. He just got to figure it out. But, uh, yeah, no, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what they do, and I I think you're right. An ultimatum might have to be put on them at some point. Um, I I think you know it's kind of an unspoken one, but and and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But this weekend is kind of one of those games. If you lose this game, you're you're in a lot of trouble. Um, but we'll move on from there. One of the uh, storylines also coming out of the game, of course, uh. Of course, clock management, that's one thing everybody's going to want to talk about. Clock management was not great at the end of the game. Um, don't know really how much you can put that on Larry Fedora. A lot of throws into the middle of the field by Nathan Elliott. And then Dave Archer was one that took an issue with the fact that it took Nathan Elliott six seconds after they got up to the line to spike the ball. I don't think what he realized was the ball was placed pretty quickly. And when you get up to the line, you have to be set for a second before you spike it or else it's a penalty. So I, I didn't take much issue with that. I took issue with the fact that they were throwing the ball into the middle of the field. They even had one pass that was complete. That was short of the first down marker um, to Anthony Ratliff Williams. So that's what I take a little bit of problem with. I didn't really take a problem with how, Fedora and the staff handled it. They didn't run the ball or anything in one of those late game situations. They did throw it the entire time. But the other thing that a lot of people had an issue with was on the final play of the game, they pull out Nathan Elliott and they put in Cade Fortin to throw the final pass of the game. Now, you know, I, I think a lot of people are going to have a problem with this from the standpoint of now you just burned a a game per se, a red shirt game per se, because now he can only play in one of the final two games and you burn that for one throw in a game that 
even if he makes that throw, more than likely you're going to still have, I mean, you're going to have to go to overtime unless Larry was going to go for it there, which who knows, the smart thing probably would have been to go for it there, but that would have been something we would have had to see if it would have ended up happening, and of course it didn't. Um, but, you know, a lot of people saying that was that was a poor decision. Some people just not understanding at all why they did it. I know that the reason that they did it was because he does have the strongest arm on the team. Now, the thing is, a lot of people were saying, well, that shows right there that Cade Fortin was 100% healthy and he should have been playing the whole game. Um, that is very far from a true statement. And I still feel like there were a lot of people that thought Fortin should have started today, whether he was 50% or 100%. I told you this before the game when I saw that he was warming up. And I knew the fan base would do this, where they would sit there and say, well, he's got to start because he's out there warming up. Just because you're warming up or taking warm-up reps does not mean that you are 100% healthy. They are just trying to get you out there on a game day, put you in full pads, and at least give you a chance to go through the motions. And of course, you know, they had him there in case, let's say that the unthinkable happened, which, I mean, for this, for, for us, it might not be the unthinkable with how many injuries we've had over the last couple of years. And you, you have Elliott and Manny Miles, who was the backup today, go down. Then you always have him there to, you know, come into the game and at least, if you needed him to, just hand the football off. But my question to you is, and, and it's like I said, I told you that I didn't think he should start unless he's 100%. And even then, in what seems like a pretty much lost season, just save him for next year and let him be 100% healthy for fall camp next, for spring camp next year and going into fall camp next year. I mean, is that your mindset too, as we sit here right now? Or are you one of those guys that said, you know, if he was even 50% healthy, we should have sent him out there? Yeah, no, I don't agree with Fortin making the one throw. Like you said, you lose the redshirt game. Um, I think if we were, let's say, already bowl eligible or still in bowl eligible possibility, you could have maybe lived with it a little bit more, but we were one in seven. So you're not going to a bowl game. The season's effectively over. I mean, you got the pride of wanting to beat your rival, but what's the chance of him coming off the pine and throwing that throwing a touchdown anyway? Um, I'd have much rather saved him if we were gonna play him till we knew he was hundred percent healthy, whether that be next week or the state game, or just get him ready, like I told you earlier, I would rather him be healthier when we get into spring camp and the quarterback position is on the line and that and that mm -hmm. battle starts happening. Um, so, yeah, I, I wasn't a fan of it. Whether it worked or not, I still disagree with you. A, losing the redshirt game, and B, you're putting a kid out there in harm's way. If he gets hit again, who knows what's going to happen to him. So another, right. another questionable decision by the coaching staff. Um and I, you know, when I saw he was warming up, I knew the fans. But well, he's he's probably starting today, or needs to needs to start over Elliott. Here's the thing: Nathan Elliott didn't beat us today. He had not beat us a lot of the games we've lost this year. So I, I don't think if Kate Fortin plays, that automatically says we win. So I'm not going to go with that theory either. I just think it was a, a a really dumb move by the coaching staff, and 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 of course it didn't pan out. Yeah, I, I will give the Elliott criticizers this. I think every single game this year, we've had moments where we've said, okay, Elliott's got to make that throw. He misses throws every game. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people are just kind of getting tired of is that, look, yeah, you, you've had your moments where you played well and you've taken care of the football for the most part. But when you're missing throws on third down and five because you're throwing behind receivers or you have these open deep throws and you're just missing these guys because you're either overthrowing them or underthrowing them, I think that's where people are frustrated. But the thing is, is like you said, we want to have him ready for the spring because if we have him ready for the spring, that's going to set us up for a good quarterback battle and is going to give us a chance to find out which quarterback of the two, because most likely, at least in our minds, it should be him and Reuter. 
There, there should be no discussion as to whether or not, well, Chaz Surratt, he started back in the 2017 season. No, Chaz Surratt, not the solution. I'm sorry, we've seen it. The decision-making is just a problem with him. Not really the strongest arm on the team either. And then when you look at Nathan Elliott, he's had this whole year to prove himself. Simply hasn't. Lacks the arm strength. Lacks the footwork. Really, at this point, you know, they seem like they don't want to run him. I don't know if there is some injury that we don't know about. R.L. Bynum, who a lot of Toriel fans probably follow, he tweeted out, well, you know, they might not want to run him because of the risk of him possibly getting injured because they don't know who they have behind him now with Fortin and Ruder out. My thing is, it doesn't really matter. When you have an offense that is the style that Larry Fedora likes to run, an offense that was heavily based on run-pass options for the last few years, you have to have a quarterback in there that you are willing to run with. Yeah, you've had two quarterbacks get injured, but at the same time, you've got to kind of say to yourself, if I take this element out of my offense, ultimately that's going to hurt my offense's ability anyways. So that would be like not having an effective quarterback in there, which right now, with Elliott just being a guy that throws the ball the whole game, that's pretty much what it is. So, you know, I, I, I don't think going with Fortin was the right thing to do. In, in that situation, or starting today, um, in that situation just blows my mind how uh, you, you used him for one play, and now that is what prevents you from being able to use him in either, either the Western Carolina game or the state game. I would assume that more than likely they would just start uh, Nathan Elliott against Western. Um, also, Western, uh, no, state, state, state is at home, yeah. Okay, I was going to say Western. Unfortunately, Western's not senior day, so we couldn't start Manny Miles and justify that as the reason to start Manny Miles because it was senior day. Um, But, you know, I I think ultimately that will be an Elliott game because, look, Western, we should be able to beat them if we have nobody at quarterback. We could run the Wildcat. Oh, which they also ran that uh, er earlier today. That was one of the play calls. Um, What was it? Second and long, they ran a wildcat play with Michael Carter that Ben Humphreys pretty much called out at the line of scrimmage. Knew they were going to run it, dropped them in the backfield. So, again, play calling just baffling, just just baffling. Um, but, yeah, no, I think uh, Fortin will – it'll be interesting to see what they're going to do. If he's – if they're feeling that he's 100% healthy, what they'll do against State. And I think one of the things – That'll be interesting is if he's 100% healthy and pretty much that's what the journalists are telling us, that's what the people closest to the team are telling us. If he doesn't start, then you kind of wonder, does Larry really realize that his job could be on the line? So that'll be that that'll be something interesting to see um, come that state game just two weeks away. And we turn to that NC State game, and here's my question for you right off the bat with that. Is that the last gasp, at least in the fan base's mind, for Larry Fedora? Well, I think the fan base has already last gasped them after ECU, Virginia Tech, Syracuse, uh, Virginia, and now uh, today with Duke. I thought you were literally just going to list off every loss. I was <laughs> like, we could be here a while. But... You would probably think so. His record against in-state rivals is not. I think it's it fell to seven and twelve today since he's been in Chapel Hill. Yep. Um, state in terms of the football side of things, even though there's not a bell or anything on the line, is the more prominent football rivalry for North Carolina, and he hasn't fared well with them. I, he's he had one at home since the Geo punt return. This could be his third straight loss to NC State at home. All of them would be senior day losses. That's not going to sit well with A, the fan base, and B, hopefully, the athletic department. So, yes, I would say going into that, whether we win next week or not, and we go in 2-8 and eight or 1-9, and nine, uh, that would probably be his last, his last chance to either save his ass or to lose his ass. So, well, well let, let, me, let me tell you this. If he loses 
next week to Western. We're not even on the Western preview part of this podcast yet. He loses next week to Western. They should not even let him walk off the field without him being jobless. Because that Western Carolina team isn't anywhere as good as the team we even faced last year. And we destroyed them last year. So let me just get that out of the way first. But I I think, yeah, no, I, I think ultimately you, you're, you're probably right. And yeah, the, the record against in-state teams is not good. Um, the only team that he's at 500 or above against is Wake Forest right now. Right. And state, state at three and three as well. Um, but that, that, more than likely in the minds of many people will change this year. Um, two and five against Duke, a team that prior coaches had seemingly owned. Right. And one and three against ECU, which I think is the most concerning. Right. Um, a team that dominated you in back-to-back years. And then this year, a team that came in on the ropes, their coach pretty much seen as gone heading into that game, and that might be what ultimately ends up saving his job because he blew you out and got them at least a little momentum going in the right direction. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, you look at all all the statistics, and I mean, when I got into the argument with the guy that is now on WCHL up in Chapel Hill, you know, it, it was, it, it's pretty much, for me, it's all there. He's 5 and 20 in his last 25 games. Since that loss to Duke back on November 10th of 2016. He is just it's just it's not working out anymore. Right. You know, you cannot be that bad. And when you look at that record, I mean, look at just the last 2 years at 4 and 17. There's only one school in the entire Power 5 that has a worse record than that and that is Oregon State are we trying to say that that's a good comparison I I mean I'm not look at what he was built on offensive success this offense the last two years is more than likely going to average 26 points or less while the defense looks like it's going to give up almost 30 or more points probably more than that And this will be back-to-back years where your points differential will be five points or more per game, which is not good at all. So, you know, I I think going into that game, if I'm Bubba Cunningham, again, like I said, he loses next week, he won't be coaching in that game if I'm Bubba. That that would be whoever your interim coach is, whether it's John Papuchas or whether it's... Chris Kapilovic, Keith Heckendorf, whoever you're rolling with in that game. But even if he wins, I think there's got to be a little bit of pressure on him to say, look, this is the one game we've got to get you to win. Because, yeah, at 2-9, and nine, this is nowhere near where we expected this team to be at the start of the year. So putting a little bit of pressure on Fedora, maybe he ends up stepping up. If not... You know, I, I again, I don't think, let, let me put it to you this way. I don't think anybody is going to be angry if they move on from him as coach. I, I don't think anybody's going to say, well, that that firing doesn't make much sense. Right now, especially on the exterior, most of the national guys in general, they think, yeah, he's pretty much as good as gone. There's only one coach in the ACC that I think right now is seen to have worse job security, and that's Bobby Petrino. Right. The wheels have fallen off of his bicycle. So let's just, uh, no, (laughs) there we go. But, uh, yeah, no, I think Fedora, there is some pressure, and we'll see, hopefully, how he responds to that. Or I mean, you you pick whichever side you're going on. But, again, we've told you, don't go all in on it because you never really know. Larry could be back next year. So, um, as I said, I don't think he lasts uh, if he doesn't get through the Western game. So we'll turn to the Western Carolina game. 
I mean, the keys to the game, I mean, I, I, I feel like it's pretty simple. First of all, you're playing an FCS opponent that, by the way, has lost seven straight games. They started the year 3-0. and That team is now 3-7. and And they have been blown out by some of their FCS opponents. You have got to dominate the line of scrimmage. You should no doubt be more talented, more physical. more physical. You should be bigger than the guys that you're seeing on the other side of the football. You should be able to dominate them without a problem. So that's the thing. You know, you, you've got to be able to dominate them in the trenches on both sides of the ball should be no question. Running the football, it's got to be your primary thing in that game. Passing game has not been all that effective this year. To me, what what that play at the end of the game should tell everybody is that, yeah, you can criticize Fedora a lot, but if you're asking why is this passing game not more dynamic, you would have to imagine that the playbook is limited. Right. If you're going to put in your backup quarterback that is coming off an injury – for one throw because it is a Hail Mary and you don't think that your starting quarterback has the arm strength to get it there. So you got to believe the playbook's limited. Run the football. You ran it for 315 yards today on 37 carries. That's eight and a half yards per carry. Run the damn football. And defensively, there sh- I mean, there, there should be no excuse. You should be faster than these guys. You, you, you've you got to be able... I mean, you, you need to be out there playing on the level that you know you're capable of. Because if you are, you, you should win this game no problem. Um, I, I mean, is there anything that you really have to add to that? Yeah, no. I've, been, I've said the same thing since I started coming on on a weekly basis. Run the ball, stop the run. Um, like you said, we're bigger, faster, stronger than they are. You ran for 315 yards against the Duke front seven that, while banged up, is probably a top 15 to 20 front seven in the country. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I'd line up and just run and run and run. Um, defensively, you try to use this game to clean up some of your stuff, build some confidence in that group. Hopefully the pass rush is a little more dynamic. Um, the secondary makes some plays, maybe get some turnovers. Really what you want to try to do in this game, other than win, is build confidence to try to find a way to upstate, upset NC State the following week. Last last year we played Western, the game before NC State. We kicked their ass. We went to Raleigh and played for them for 60 minutes. So it, it could happen again this year. Hopefully you get in a position where the game's over early, but you keep Elliott in there and maybe you expand the playbook to try to find some other things that you didn't think was there. Um, but you know me, it's gotta be all Michael Carter from the word go. I think he's earned the right, even with right. his fumbling issues. He's too dynamic. He's too fast. He's breaking tackles. Um, just just a more complete runner, I think, than anyone else on the on the roster. And to me, it starts with him. Get him the ball. Make him the focus of your offense, and go out there and 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 you know get a home win. Yeah, no, and, and you're right. Uh, more decisive in the backfield. I, I feel like that showed just on the few carries that he had as opposed to Antonio Williams. His speed really does make a difference, especially when you're running both of those guys on the edge where you've had most of your success. In the middle of your offensive line, that's where they've been struggling to get the blocks necessary to open the holes to create big runs. On the edges, you know, you're trusting guys like William Sweet and Charlie Heck and also the tight end Jake Vargas, who has been doing a great job, to seal those outside running lanes, and they've done well. That's where Michael Carter does his best work, and we saw that again today, as we've seen at times throughout this season. So I agree. Give him the bulk of the carries. Let him go to work. Um, Also, Jordan Brown needs to see more carries. I thought he was effective the last two weeks when he saw the carries that he did have. And on third down, if you're going to put a running back in the backfield, that's got to be your guy because he's the best receiver out of the backfield. It's plain and simple. We saw that the last two years. Hell, last year, he was our leading receiver until about halfway through the season. And this year, he's got a minimal role. Doesn't make a ton of sense. One of the other things, you've got to stop shooting yourself in the foot. 
They had penalties all over the place. And look, you can say that some of these penalties were terrible. Trust me, some of them were. The holding on the first offensive drive of the second half on Carl Tucker was terrible. Absolutely terrible. Watched the replay multiple times. Did not see even remotely where they were calling that. I, I, I He was just a, it was a simple block. And I, for some reason, they threw the flag. But plays like the Jake Vargas block, which at the time I thought, you know, probably was a little bit of a bad call. Still think most of the time that probably goes uncalled because most of the time the refs are not really keeping their eyes in the backfield that much. But it was unnecessary. The late hit on Timon Fox, a personal foul, that continued to drive. Now, luckily, they were able to get off the field within the next set of three downs. But at the same time, unnecessary. Had a couple of pass interference penalties. Now, people said they wanted to turn, you know, they they want these guys to turn their heads more often. I do agree with that. But at times, if you've got a guy like Dominic Ross in coverage, if he turns his head, that's the difference between him being there to make a play and a man catching a pass for a touchdown. Because when you turn your head, you're going to have to slow down. But still, you got to be able to be a little bit smarter about where you're at in location to the receiver and, and where that ball is. So, you know, it, it's just, it's things like that that you, you've got to keep from, you know, doing to yourself. Because this is not other teams beating you, it's you beating yourself. And then, you know, one of the other things they've got to adjust, the third down defense was terrible today. Right. 13 third down conversions from Duke. Seven of them were from seven yards or longer. That simply cannot happen. And you can say whatever you want about how bad the secondary played. Part of that is on the defensive line for not getting any pass rush. One of the first times the entire season that both Malik Carney and Timon Fox were on the field, and they generated zero pass rush. They had one sack the entire day as a unit, and it was defensive tackle Jason Strobridge, who was in and out of the game all day because of injury. So you've got to be able to get to the quarterback on those third downs, put a little bit of pressure on them. And, I mean, there were certain plays where Daniel Jones, third and 10, Daniel Jones runs for a first down. Right. On the outside. No linebacker there to help. You've got to be able to make adjustments like that. When you're getting destroyed by a running quarterback, Larry, add the third linebacker into the game. Why do you continue to go nickel and dime packages and have no one in the middle of the field to take away the possibility of a quarterback run. It's things like that that just make people frustrated. We'll see how they're able to adjust against a team in Western Carolina that so far has struggled, but they're going to have a running quarterback. We know that from last year. The guy who was there last year, um, I think his name's Tyree Adams, if I remember correctly. He does return. Not as dynamic of an offense as they were a year ago, but still, as we know, running quarterbacks have historically given Larry Fedora teams trouble. So uh, with that, I I think this is the thing. There is no line on this week's game because we do play an FCS team. Um, So, you know, we'll get to the predictions. I'll still give a prediction. I'll do an outright prediction for this week. But as always, our picks are presented by Hustle Hands. Hustle Hands, it's an innovative company based on the idea of working as hard as you possibly can to make your goals achievable as possible. For apparel designed by fellow Tar Heel Chad Boucher, go online to HustleHands.com. Check out the podcast Wednesday nights on Facebook. Just search Hustle Hands Worldwide. Hustle Hands, it's more than a brand. It's a way of life. So we turn to you first, as we always do. And your outright prediction for this upcoming week's game against Western Carolina. Let's see, last year we scored over 60. I don't think we get that that number to this week. Um, I think Carolina wins decisively. I think they build off the run game. The defense, just by the opponent, has probably their best game of the year, we would hope and expect. And route to a 42-10 victory. And like I said earlier, when I look in this game, hopefully we find some consistency 
in the run game. We find some stuff that we didn't think we could have because we had a chance to work on things to find some stuff to get ready for NC State because we're going to need some stuff to take down Dave Doran's club. But I, I'm expecting an ass kicking. Um, you know, we joke all the time during some games, this game better be over by halftime. This is one of those games that by halftime, the game better be over. And, and so, and, and I, I think it will be. Um, and so, yeah, I got Carolina winning 42 to 10. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, our offense has definitely shown signs in a few halves of games. You know, we saw it at times against Syracuse. We saw it at times last week against Georgia Tech. And once again, we saw it here today against Duke. I think they do put some points up on the board. I think they run the ball well, uh, hopefully. Um, I, I think hopefully they go to the running game a little bit more. Michael Carter, the focal point of the running game. Uh, I'd like to see more of those handoffs. Daz Newsom was in the backfield for an 84-yard touchdown on a handoff. I'd like to see if, if you want to do the gadget plays, Make them more like that instead of having Rontavious Toe Groves throw a pass. Right. Those are the types of plays you want to see. I'd like to see some of those dual sets in the backfield with the quarterback. I thought that was effective when we saw it at times today. Have two of your talented running backs back there. I mean, this backfield is so loaded with talent. Put them on the field at the same time and make these teams worry about which guy is going to get the football. Also, if you can, get Nathan Elliott involved in the run game. Because, again, when he's been involved in the run game, that has made him a a better passer. Again, makes no sense. Makes no sense. But somehow it does allow him to get involved in the run game because that will get him going, and that will also have to keep that thought in the minds of defenses instead of saying, let's just load the box because we know there's just going to be a handoff to their running back. And, yeah, as I said, dominate in the trenches. You're bigger. You're more physical. You you should be able to take control of this game early and keep control of this game. I think Carolina wins it 52-7 to over Western Carolina. So, uh, I think that's it. We got anything else we want to touch on here before we, uh, we roll out for this week? Nope, I'm done. All right, man. So... Uh, of course, we want to thank you guys for listening to this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. As always, you can listen and subscribe to the podcast on Spreaker, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn.com, or the TuneIn app. This week's game against Western Carolina will kick off at 3.30. Not, where, where, do we know what the TV coverage is on that yet? It's probably going to be, what, Fox Sports South? So like I think yeah, I think that might be guys. yeah, I think that might be yeah, Fox Sports South 646 for Direct TV, and then I'm trying to remember the channel number for Time Warner. Not sure about that, um, but check uh, your local listings for the game, um, and I think it will also be on the Watch ESPN app. So check there. Uh, Jones Angel will be on the call for the Tar Heel Sports Network along with Brian Simmons. That's 99.3 FM and 1110 AM WBT in Charlotte, 97.9 FM and 1360 AM WCHL in Chapel Hill, and 106.1 FM WTKK in Raleigh. For others, please check your local listings. Thank you guys for listening once again, and as always, go Tar Heels!